because we will run out of time otherwise. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Owen to introduce himself uh, and give his section next. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Owen Miller. I'm a software engineer. I studied robotics and computer science. Um, I'm currently the convener for Fusion. I've run as a candidate. Um, so yeah, let's dive right in. Uh, how is bad software undermining our society? So when we think of software undermining our society, uh, most people would think of, you know, killer AIs actively killing us, or perhaps what was prophesized with the Y2K bug, the idea of the electricity grid going offline and planes falling out of the sky. What often gets ignored, though, is the rampant spread of suboptimal software, which, although less dramatic, it still manages to hold back society, and it still manages to bring down companies or industries along the way. Let's start with a recent example. A child had a swollen penis, and the parents contacted their doctor about it. Uh, they were instructed to send a photo. When the father took the photo, it was automatically synced with, uh, with Google. Google scanned it and then uh, reported the father to police, accusing him of molesting his son. Now, the child made a full recovery, but the father remains locked out of all his Google accounts, his personal email, his business email, his calendar, uh, Google Fi, his mobile service, even the Google Authenticator app, so he can't even log into non-Google accounts. Now, despite all these sorts of problems that happen with Google software, you know, Google remains strong. It has various monopolies. People feel they're locked in. But for companies that can't survive as easily with their buggy software, we can look to the Internet of Things, or as some call it, the Internet of Shit. The Internet of Things has become <laughs> abundant with uh, buggy software, especially security bugs. Um, take, for instance, the first Bluetooth hair straightener, um, which was revealed to be hackable, so you could remotely start a fire, uh, or the repeated hacks of the various smart door locks. Um, this industry, it was once built as the fourth industrial revolution, and indeed it could have been. People have long hoped for an interconnected cybernetic society as a way of improving efficiency and creating harmony. If we look to crypto as well, another industry praised with lofty predictions that have unfortunately failed to materialize. Smart contracts, zero-knowledge proofs, we could have created a trustless society where, just like a vending machine, it's mechanically guaranteed that the contract will be followed. Instead, we're left to depend on governments to ensure that contracts are followed. The government has to impose its monopoly on violence to implement law and order in a way that's slow, expensive, and very hit and miss. So who should get involved with software to make it right? Should governments get involved? Is it just an issue for consumers to sort out themselves? Is it even a big deal? Well, things have gotten so bad that we killed off the fourth industrial revolution. If things are at this scale, then surely we can already call it a market failure, can't we? And look at what's ahead. As we just saw, as AI becomes even more capable, when you look at these toasters and these shit coins, what sort of quality can you really expect from AI? A clue to the solution here, though, is how we might define killer AIs. There's a the popular example of the paperclip maximizer, which destroys the earth so it can keep making more paperclips. But look at what we already have. We have soulless companies and governments whose pursuit of GDP growth is actively killing life on our planet. So here's my claim. We have bad software because primarily software, the software being made is software that serves GDP maximization. We've seen software that's not made for GDP maximization. Um, the open source community has produced um, Linux, for instance. It's produced some of the most widespread programs in our society. Furthermore, the organizations responsible for creating this GDP software, they tend to grow large. So it encourages laziness and satisficing. Startups come along once in a while and improve things. When Instagram was purchased by Facebook, for instance, for $1 billion, it only had 13 employees at the time. So in order to get good software, we need the engineers to be in small organizations or they need to be personally invested in the outcome. Imagine if you could work on an open source security library and actually update the software within your smart door lock. Imagine if you actually had the right to repair the internet connected bricks that you purchased. Um, so the government has a duty here to get involved in this space because it's, the software world is a public commons and because our digital world is such a huge part of society, which we would like to be democratic. We've got glimpses of what a cybernetic society looks like. In Chile in 1971, they started Project Cybersyn, 
And now in Estonia, uh, government processes have all become digitalized. Um, and so now in Estonia, they're only paying a flat 20% income tax rate. They have higher happiness ratings than Italy and Spain, and they're ranked as the best place in Europe for doing business. So to achieve this goal in Australia, firstly, all government software should be open source so we can improve it. Then secondly, the government should implement a universal basic income so motivated people can have the freedom to create software which benefits humanity they're not dependent on a paycheck from a foreign tech giant. And, you know, people outside the software industry, they have a hard time seeing what we're missing out on. But the results from Estonia, they really speak for themselves. We can dream so much bigger of what's possible for Australia. Thank you.